Ah, yes, there you are. And a very good evening to you all from here in the Boyne Valley. Welcome to the Mythical Ireland Library. I'm Anthony Murphy. This is Live Irish Myths, episode number 172. This evening, we are continuing our perusal of historical texts in relation to the Vikings and their marauding campaign and the terrifying activities which they <clears throat> foisted upon the uh, Irish community at the time. I hope you're all keeping safe and well no matter where you are in the world. I'm delighted to report that as we approach Equinox the evenings are stretching out lovely here and we had the most beautiful sunset this evening in the Boyne Valley. I would like to, to, to say a very special hello to a member of the Tua, Valerie Gallagher. Valerie is from Rhode Island in the United States, is a regular viewer of Live Irish Myths, and is currently right here in the Boyne Valley. I had the pleasure of the company of Valerie uh, for a tour of some of the monuments in the Boyne Valley this afternoon. I'm going to make you all really jealous now. <laughs> She brought a gift. Our Valerie brought a gift from Stonehenge. And boy, is this a welcome addition to the Mythical Ireland Library. Woo! <laughs> Coffee table stuff this. The world of Stonehenge, the British Museum. So thank you, Valerie, for... Uh, your wonderful company this afternoon and for the lovely gift which I have been perusing over the last half hour and I'm really really looking forward to reading this this is a very very special piece of work so thank you for that um yes indeed uh the uh, the end of twilight has only just been reached here we are looking forward to springing forward. Uh, most of you in the United States, but not all, have sprung forward this past weekend. So at the moment, there is only a four hour differential between Ireland and New York, whereas there is normally a five hour difference. That will uh, um, defer or re return back to the normal situation when we spring forward in two weekends time if you're watching we are streaming live on the mythical ireland facebook page and on the mythical ireland uh youtube channel if there's somebody on the facebook page that would share the live stream to the mythical ireland community and or the mythical ireland creatives group that would be brilliant if you're here and you're dropped in, do please feel free to say hello. First in the house this evening is Barbara Barney. Hello, Barbara, and welcome to Live Irish Myths. Donna Jean Porter is in the house. Hello, Donna Jean Giarich. Train on the Irk says good evening to Nonawa. Train on Connasata too. Dawn Hilton is in the house. Hello there, Dawn. Paula Snow Queen. Wave can't stay at Vets with Cat. Hope the cat's all right. That's the main thing, Paula. And uh, thanks for saying hello. Annette Purd is in Tara. Beautiful sunset this evening, indeed. Yes, I didn't have my camera with me, but I, but I, boy, boy, did have my phone, and uh, yeah, got uh, spectacular. Well, I, I think it's a lovely, a lovely picture of the sun setting over the hill of Slane. So I might share that on the page later on. Glad you enjoyed that, Annette. Elaine Dent Lingenfelter is in the house, and it's a beautiful, sun, shiny day in Texas. And may the sun shine in all of your lives right at this moment. Amanda Morgan is in Australia. A very good morning, Amanda, to you and all our friends on the other side of the world. A happy Tuesday to you from those of us who are st still in Monday uh, on this side of the world. Uh, Irish technical thinker, who's Marcus, is in the house. Hello there, Marcus. You're very welcome. Karen Fay O'Loughlin is in Boulder, Colorado. Finally out of our cold snap. Brilliant stuff. Summer is coming. 
Anne Scott Doherty's in the house. Hello there, Anne. You're very, very welcome to Live Irish Myths. Eileen O'Sullivan says, good evening, and a very good evening to you. Stephen Walker is in Atlanta, where we, where we went from 20 degrees to 64 in about 20 hours. Crazy. Totally, totally crazy. Wow. Valerie Gallagher, there she is. Yay. <laughs> yes, a, 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 it's just so wonderful to be out in the valley uh, on what was such a beautiful day, a beautiful evening, and to see such a gorgeous golden sunset over this island of the setting sun. Paul Alberl says that it's a beautiful day in Daphne, Alabama on the Gulf Coast. Great to see you. The same to you, Paul. It is always a pleasure. Archaeoastronomy Database, who's Ty, says greetings one and all. Hello, Ty. Welcome along. Mar Mary Latari is in Bangor, Maine, although my people from Cork and Kerry. And I should have mentioned that Valerie, our good friend Valerie of Rhode Island, uh, has a descendancy from uh, Donegal and Cork. What a fabulous combination. I reckon, Valerie, you, mu you must be a good singer because the people of Donegal and the people of Cork both speak as if they're singing. Yes, indeed, it is a great gift, a fabulous gift for which I am very grateful. Mandy McCurl is saying hello from a cold, wet Isle of Mull. Hope you're all keeping well. Indeed, and we are. And I hope, pardon me, that the cold and wet goes away fairly soon. Carmelo Dwyer says, good to see you. Book looks good. What a lovely gift. Yes, indeed. Hi, Carmel. Welcome. Sue Prenter. Lucky lad. Evening all. Trinol Noah, Sue. Joe Butler is in sunny but cool Colorado. Uh, Slauncha Joe. Welcome along. Lisa Collins is in Minnesota. Hello to all our Minnesotan. Min I was going to say Minnesota one, but there's no need to add the O. Minnesotan friends. Tarini Pendleton is in Laguna Beach, California. Tarini... Every time you say you're in Laguna Beach, I just picture you on a lounger at the beach with a sunshade over you, you know, sitting up, reading a book, sipping on a pina colada or something like that. Is that an inaccurate picture? <laughs> Salav says, Banakti Dutch Anthony August Ikawa do Chak. Goimij Gok Ra Ernatua Os Chiron. Not quite sure what the entirety of that be means, uh, but uh, I'm very glad to welcome you to Gunday Nalu uh, this evening. Uh, Alan Hoskins is, is saying hello, Anthony, and to the rest of this wonderful family. It's been a beautiful spring day in North Tip slash Clare. Brilliant stuff. Mariana Dunn says, Banakti. From sunny Virginia. Glad to hear that the sun is shining for so many of you. Wayne Bird is in the house and is saying hello from Birmingham. Hello, Wayne. Sheila Gunn is saying hi to the Tua. And we have sprung. However, it is snowing again. It's coming for sure. <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, summer, that is. Uh, uh, and a quick melt for the snow, hopefully. Hi, Anthony, says Nick Eska Casterton. Been a lovely blue a lovely day, blue sky and sun. Felt like spring today over here in Mercia. Most welcome. Yes, I have to say it's really, you can feel that winter is over, hopefully, and summer is coming. Catherine Woodruff is saying hello to everyone. Catherine, you're very welcome. Caitlin Moon, you've got a nice spring in your step, Anthony. <laughs> ah, Caitlin. Your uh, Facebook posts are regularly very entertaining. Thank you for brightening my day. Helena Breen is saying good evening uh, to uh, myself and all the two. Uh, uh, Helena, you're very, very welcome. Desiree Riley is in the house. Please stand up and take a bow. <laughs> Our very, very special. You're all very special, of course. But Desiree is special from the point of view that I mispronounce her name. And she likes it. <laughs> Anne McCallum is in the house. Hello, Anton and the mighty Tua. Hope everyone is in fine fettle. Another cold, snowy, windy weekend. But a lovely sunny morning today. What has since clouded over. However, a treat in store with part two of the Vikings. Yes, indeed. John Main is saying, Banachti, Anthony and all the Tua. Good to be here from a dry but chilly Belmullet, County Mayo. 
Looking forward to learning more about Ireland's Norse and Viking heritage. Brilliant stuff. Great to have you along, Anne and John. Valerie Gallagher is finally saying hello from Ireland, and not just from Ireland, but from about three miles up the road in here in the Boyne Valley. Brilliant stuff. Elizabeth Champagne says greetings, and we say greetings back to you. It is such a wonderful name, Champagne. And uh, we shall all celebrate Elizabeth's arrival with a glass. I'm sure you've never heard that before. Catherine Marion Moore is in Salem, Oregon. It's so nice to see you again. Well, the feeling is mutual, Catherine. You're very welcome to Live Irish Myths, where we're going to have a an interesting further discussion of the Vikings. Susan Scott says, oh, whoops, time change caught me up, but I'm happy to be here. Hello, Anthony and the two at Northwest Connecticut. Susan, you're just in time, which is grand. No problem. Nora Gaffney O'Connor says, Giarive Golair, beautiful sunset this evening. Yes, indeed. I hope it was nice also where you are, because it certainly was rather beautiful here there's barbara murphy another of the extended murphy clan has joined us for this episode and you're very welcome jane duff is in texas hello jane you're very welcome to the live stream valentina bernardi says good evening everyone Trinonoa, gochtina Golair. tom king is in the house uh, hello anthony and friends of the Tua, hope all a good fettle, beautiful day at the Boyne Valley. Yes, indeed. Still under clear skies and working away. I'm just checking the space weather. There was aurora borealis late last night, which I missed. KP equals two, quiet and damn. KP equals six, was storm earlier. Looks like the uh, chances of aurora have faded, but I missed the opportunity last night, but that's my own fault. Because I decided to stay here writing. Diana Wakeman is in Florida. Hello, Diana. You are very, very welcome. Uh, Adrian Beglin says, greetings all. Adrian, it's great to see you in the library again. Jackie McCandless is in Stroud in Gloucestershire. You're very, very welcome, uh, Jackie. Is Gloucestershire one of those place names that's as difficult to pronounce as Worcestershire? <laughs> I'm I'm kidding. I'm sure you've never heard that before. <laughs> Adina Sparks is hoping everyone is well. Wish the weather would decide whether it's spring or winter. Well, I wish it would just decide to be spring in that case. But uh, yeah, hopefully it will uh, get a spring in its step soon enough. Kathy May Dayo is in the house. Glad to get in on the end. It's not the end. It's only the beginning, Kathy May. There is a difference in the time uh, zones because most of the states sprung forward uh, at the weekend, but we have not yet sprung forward. We won't do that for another two weekends. In the meantime, uh, the differential between uh, Dublin and New York is only four hours where it's normally five, or should I say the Boyne Valley and New York. Uh, and for the West Coast, you're normally watching at 12 noon, but you should be, if I'm right, watching at 1 p.m. now. But that will revert in a couple of weeks' time. Michael Pike is in the house. Michael, who is a patron of Mythical Ireland, and being at the level he's at, Michael gets treated to lots of goodies. That's the address there, patreon.com forward slash Mythical Ireland, if you want to become a patron like Michael and be one of the lucky ones. Kathy Sue is in Indiana in the US. You're very welcome, Kathy Sue. Great to see you in the house. Sheila Gunn is saying hello to Desiree. There you go, private chat channel there. We shall not interfere. Uh, Teresa K is uh, in uh, Oregon. Uh, that's Mark and Teresa. Wow, uh, a great pleasure to see you both. You're very welcome into our live stream here, streaming from Mythical Ireland headquarters in the Mythical Ireland Library, Boyne Valley, Ireland. Uh, Erica Humberdusi is in the house watching from Ipswich in Suffolk. You're very welcome, Erica, as always. The Curious Celt, one for the diary, Anthony, <coughs> excuse me, Boyne Valley Viking Experience, May 21st and 22nd, Slane Castle. Checks diary. Checks calendar. Ooh, oh, it looks like I'm free that weekend. Vikings slain castle. Do you know what? I might as well put it into the calendar now because sure enough, if I don't, I won't remember when the time comes. 
Uh, hang on a second. If I put in the right time, say this. No, 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 no. What did what you? No, I did that wrong. Twenty first. What did you say? Twenty first of May. Yes, 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 yes. Let's say. Let's call it. Yes, yes, indeed. Yes, good, 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 good. Yes, brilliant. Done. Thank you. Thank you for that. The curious Celt, whose name I can't remember. I do apologize. Sarah Walker Brown is in southeast Minnesota. As we sprung forward yesterday, Robin sightings. Spring is near. We had a Robin singing to us from a tree at Douth this afternoon, myself and Valerie. It was very pleasant. And the yellow hammers from the trees, which was fabulous. Kathy May says it's pouring rain in Newcastle, Washington State. Sounds very Irish. <laughs> Michael, Mike, you mean Worcester sauce. <laughs> Worcester, Worcester, Worcester sauce. Three things that are difficult to say. I love you, I'm sorry, and Worcester sauce. <laughs> Mark Gordon says good day from Iowa. Hello, Mark. You're very welcome. Uh, Helena Breen says most here call them the Shires. That makes life easy, doesn't it? Thomasina Egan says evening all in Ackle Island. No Aurora here. No, but Ackill, what a fabulous part of the world. And you're just down the road from our John Main, who's in Bell Mullet. Regina Riley, hello there, Giagutch. Uh, Jane Wynn is apologising for being late. This is a no brown zone. There's no need to apologise. I am not like a university lecturer who lo looks at the clock and tuts loudly and goes like this when somebody walks in late. But we do like to sometimes make an example of people just for the fun. But in your case, we're not going to do that. <laughs> Doug Nolan is in Arizona in the USA. Doug, you are so welcome. Maureen Joyce is in Lexington in Kentucky. Good afternoon to you, Maureen. Roberta Duffy is in sunny Los Angeles in California. As I always said, until John Main lived there and told us otherwise, you know, I would expect that it's sunny all the time in California, but apparently not. But great to hear that it is right now. Uh, P. Nuddy official. Uh, I don't know what your correct title is, but hopefully that is uh, introduction enough. Hello from New Jersey. First live stream of yours. Thanks. Well, you're very, very welcome. And I hope you enjoy yourself. Uh, and don't forget that there are 171 previously uh, streamed uh, videos on the YouTube channel. I hope you enjoy them. And we are caught up with the comments. Finally, it's great to see you all. I hope everybody is well. I think I said that already. We started our exploration of the Vikings last week. And I kind of left you hanging a little bit. Well, hang no more. There is no more cliffhanging. We are about to dive into the second part, which is a continuation of the reading that we began last week from John Ryan SJ's book, Ireland from AD 800 to AD 1600, published, I think, in 1961, but I'm not entirely sure because it actually doesn't have the year of publication uh, in the opening few pages, which is unusual, it must be said. Most books uh, do indicate uh, the year of publication. So has everybody got the popcorn and the Coke and the sweets? and the Scots clan, and the apple, or whatever you're having, the mead slash cider slash glass of Pinot Grigio slash a uh, glass of uh, Chardonnay slash glass of Merlot slash whiskey slash Sambuca, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, oh, sorry, I do apologize. Slash tea slash coffee slash jug of water slash beaker of milk there you go paul campbell is in galway paul it is a great delight to welcome you as always doris o'hara is uh, just in from work that's perfectly okay and no need to apologize uh, doris this as i say is a no brown zone <laughs> caitlin moon <laughs> can you start making t-shirts i want one that says this is a no brown zone fabulous idea caitlin in fact yes I'm going to start doing that very soon. There have to be mythical. I want one that says the high man on it. So people look at me and goes, is he, is he, is he, you know? And I like, no, 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 no. You misunderstand. And then tell them all about the high man. 
Cy B is in the house. Exciting, exciting re Viking uh, in, in IE. They were big in Limerick, I know. Yes, indeed. Among other areas. <laughs> Salav is giving us the entire pictographic rundown of what people may be snacking, uh, feasting, slash dining uh, on, slash while they're imbibing, slash drinking, slash getting peed. <coughs> Excuse me. Did I say that? Did I say getting pissed <coughs> out loud? I used the F-bomb on a live stream recently for the Ireland Reads. Yes, I did. I said the F-word. I did. No, not the one we usually are talking about the other one, the bold one. Robin Rickman is in the house or in the library. Robin is in Pennsylvania. Robin, it's very good to see you. Michael Pike says, I'm up for Mythical Ireland t-shirts. Yes. And if you'd like to suggest some slogans and designs, we will certainly try to make that happen. Sounds like a great idea. Robin says she's just in time for the stand-up comedy. Yes, indeed. <sighs> Rins Ranger is in the house. A uh, very uh, good evening to you. And uh, <laughs> John Lane, certainly. Do we have a bar person, somebody who can serve drinks, perhaps? Don't forget, by the way, if you're in Ireland on the 22nd of May, oh, which is the weekend of the Vikings thing in Slane, hmm, we could make a weekend of it. On, the, on Sunday, the 22nd of May, let me just check the time. We are having our first ever gathering, as in face-to-face -face gathering, of the Tua on the Hill of Tara at 2 p.m. on the afternoon of Sunday, the 22nd of May. No need to book. Doesn't cost anything. We're not selling tickets. It's just, I'm going to be there, and John Main is going to be there, and Tom King is going to be there. We're hoping to have the pleasure of the company of Morgan Llewellyn, the author, and loads of members of the Tua have already said count me in absolutely I will be there the plan is we're going to have if it's a nice day bring a packed lunch and a flask of tea and we're going to have a picnic in the banqueting hall Chakmichurta on the hill of Tara now, doesn't that sound like a fabulous afternoon and we'll just basically have a bit of chat a bit of crack and enjoy the company and if people so wish i will lead a short tour of the hill of tara in which i will talk about its traditions and its mythology and its history and talk about the monuments and we'll just basically all enjoy each other's company and get the opportunity to see each other face to face instead of this you know computer screen stuff that we've all been very glad for but uh which uh it gets a, a bit you know we like we're social animals us humans i should also say that i missed a trick on saturday uh well i was busy with domestic duties and catching up on things but saturday was the 12th of march saturday was the second anniversary of the announcement of the first covid 19 restrictions in ireland which began on the 13th of March in 2020. Uh, so Thursday, the 12th of March, 2020, was the date upon which episode one of Live Irish Myths was live streamed. So we're uh, two years over uh, and counting. Um, well, wish it and it will happen. Daisy Peters is in the house. Hello, Daisy. You're very welcome. So, um, yeah, look, if you're there, or Elaine is pointing out that if you don't happen to bring a lunch, you can get great sandwiches up at Maguire's. Yes, absolutely. And they do coffees and everything else. And their toilets, the public toilets are open again, which is great, which means that if we're going to be up there, which I imagine we will be for at least a couple of hours, if not a few hours, uh, then it would be good to have the... Uh, facilities near at hand so as i say feel free to join us in a face-to-face -face gathering of the tour whoever is available sunday 22nd of may 2 p.m hill of tara chawanari kumbanami be there or don't be there but if you don't be there you're going to miss all the fun so there you go caitlin moon is suggesting that uh, march 12th was also her birthday wow 
what is it 20 now caitlin is it well come here happy birthday to you and i hope you had a great day on saturday all us march hares i tell you we are just a little bit out there we're special aren't we but happy birthday to you and hope you have a great day do, 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 do. happy birthday dear caitlin happy birthday to you kathy may will be there in spirit but come here don't worry because there is every possibility that these will perhaps not become absolutely regular meetings but certainly semi-regular i'm thinking twice or three times a year we could organize some sort of outing in which we could bring the two together at some sacred or ancient place and just enjoy the company you know <laughs> don't go breaking my heart do 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 Anyway, let's start the reading, shall we? What time? Are we? Oh, my God, it's 26 minutes. For God's sake, Anthony, will you stop waffling? Uh, number 172, 26 minutes. Right. Just for the YouTubers afterwards, the ones that don't like the hellos. Samantha Healy's in the house. Hello, Samantha. We're just about to start. How timely. Lots of people saying happy birthday to Caitlin. Where are we? Where are we? We are starting in a section that calls The Struggle Continues in Loch Quinn. And Loch Quinn was the northern half of Ireland at a time when it was divided into two portions, the northern being called Loch Quinn, Loch being the Irish for half, Quinn being the Irish for Ceown, like head, the head half, and Loch Moga, or Loch Moga, or Loch Moga, uh, which is the uh, southern half. Are we all comfortable? Yes, I hope that you are all suitably ensconced. Niall Glundov, Blackknees. Wow. Niall Blackknees. Niall Glundov, son of Aed Finlia, succeeded Flan Sinna as High King in 916. Or should that be Flan Sinna? I think perhaps it should be pronounced. He began his reign by celebrating the great national fair of Tolchu which had been abandoned then for many years. In, <coughs> pardon me, excuse me. <coughs> James Farrelly has joined us as well. Hello, James. Glad that you're able to stumble over the threshold. In 917, he fought the Norse of Waterford, some near, somewhere near Clonmel, which is in Tipperary, but without success. And the foreigners held that town until the coming of the Normans. The next year, he made a determined effort to drive the Norse from Dublin, renewing the attack in 919 at the head of a wide confederation of northern kings. But he was defeated by citric. Uh, and that's not citric acid, by the way. That's S-I-T-R-I-C. Is that citric the squinty? There is a Viking leader called Citric the Squinty. There was something wrong with one of his eyes. I kid you not. His name was Citric the Squinty. He was defeated by Citric on the Liffey near Island Bridge at a place called Kel Mohamog from a neighbouring church. Niall fell mortally wounded in battle. I bet you his knees were black then. From the time of his grandson Donal onwards, his descendants are known by the family name O'Neill, or O'Neill. That's fascinating. Raids. Raids on northern lands by Citric and his successor, Gottfric, were avenged in 921 by Murchertach, son of Niall, in a battle near Armagh, where the slaughter was such that only a few of the Norse escaped. For 22 years after this date, Murchertach remained the most prominent leader in the country, surpassing by far the new southern Inail king, high king, should I say, Donacha, whose daughter he married. The chroniclers rejoiced 
in making long lists of Murkhartok's victories. His most daring exploit was a hosting in 941, from which he became known as Murkhartok Nagokal Kraken, <laughs> Murkhartok of the Leather Cloaks. The frost that winter was unusually severe, so that the lakes and rivers were passable and the foreigners were frozen into their harbours. They didn't, the Vikings didn't bring ice breakers. Citric was the name, James is asking, yes, but S, S I T R I C, Citric. Citric Shias. <laughs> Never mind, sorry, that's not even funny. <clears throat> Excuse me. Murchertok saw his opportunity with a picked force said to number a thousand men, each provided with a protecting cloak of prepared skin. He made a circuit of the whole island and exacted hostages from every king. His journey was easy, save over the wild hills of the Doyle Hosh. The royal hostages were brought to Aljach and there, for a few months, liberally entertained according to their rank. I wonder, does that mean mead for him and whiskey for her or what? The royal hostages, in fact, I imagine because he handpicked a thousand men, there were no her, hers. It was just him's. The royal hostages were brought, sorry, blah, 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 blah. With self-sacrificing loyalty, they were then handed over to the high king. Never before had fighting men been called out for a winter campaign. And never before had so long a period of military service been demanded. But Murchertok was a leader of outstanding quality, and his enthusiasm was inspiring. In 943, this, quote, Hector of the Western world, unquote, was killed by a son of the King of Dublin in battle near Ardi. And of course, Ardi is Balia a Erdia which is the Ford of Ferdia, where Cúchulainn was said to have vanquished his friend and foe, Ferdia, uh, in Toynbo Cúlinge, which is the modern-day town of Ardi in the county of Louth. Yes, that's about 10 miles up the road that way. A year later, Domacha died. Neither for the moment, neither for the moment, found a successor of sufficient years or merit. The high kingship was therefore assumed by Congolach, king of Brea, who had constitutionally no right to the position. And he is uh, quite comically referred to by one of the guides, the OPW guides at Nouth, as uh, King Kong, <laughs> King Congolach of Brea, who would have been seated, who would have had his headquarters at Nouth, because Nouth, of course, was the capital of uh, northern Brea at the time. Congolach fought manfully against the Norse until slain by a Dublin army under Olaf Coram in 956. Donal, son of Murchertach, then became High King. <coughs> Excuse me. Mike Hill is in Rialto, Dublin 8. Hello there, Mike. You're very welcome. Did I miss somebody else? Uh... Amish, Denise, Denise Carley, and Mavanway, who's late, sit in the corner and write a hundred lines. I must not be late for class. Joke. You're very welcome. <laughs> <clears throat> Is this Friday Bridget's Day? No, Robin. The first of February is Bridget's Day. This Friday is Sheila's Day. Ha <laughs> ha Wife of St. Patrick. It seems to have been the aim of the new ruler, that's Donal, son of Murchertach, to meet the Norse with their own weapons. Well, what a... Uh, uh, what a, a, a curious uh, novelty. Thus we find him at the head of large fleets active upon the inland waters on Loch Ne, Loch Urn, Loch Uchter, and Loch Enel. Towards the end of his hard life as a war, war leader, he retired to the monastery of Armagh, where he died in 980, quote, after penitence, unquote. 
Despite their many victorious raids, their excellent organization and their admitted skill, the Norse never succeeded in occupying more than a tiny portion of the country. So, Robin, the story is that from next year, we will have a new bank holiday, a new public holiday in Ireland, which is going to be on St. Bridget's Day. But the government decided that for this year, just this year, they would make the ex extra public holiday on the 18th of March. Now, they didn't announce that with any fanfare in terms of the significance of that day. But that day, of course, was in pre-famine times known as Sheila's Day. Excuse me. Some square miles to the north of Dublin, the Gaul Cheer round Waterford, a stretch of land around Limerick, were held precariously as their quote unquote, excuse me, kingdoms. At the two great northern fjords or inlets, still known as Carlingford and Strangford, they had no settlements. Wexford was a peaceful trading station. Waterford was comparatively weak. Limerick was dangerously inland. So that war was waged, for the most part, by the Dublin Norse and their allies. Compared with the territory lost in the Frankish realm and in England, the Irish loss in land was indeed almost insignificant. <clears throat> Partial assimil assimilation of the Norse. Before the close of the 10th century, the majority of the foreigners had completed the slow and halting passage from paganism to Christianity. Once this was accomplished, the way was open for their entrance into the Irish body politic and into the unity of Christendom. Their conduct may not have been such as brought much credit to their new religion, but the ferocious savagery of earlier days had at least been overcome. Yes, Desiree notices that uh, uh, Coda is making his voice very much heard in the background, as is Kathy May. Sandrine Brady's in the house. It's been a long time since I've caught an episode uh, live. Hope everyone's doing well. So one extra holiday, great news. And yes, this year and next year, and from uh, from every year after that, in celebration of a, uh, a female, which is wonderful. This year it's Sheila, and from next year on, Bridget. Intermarriage between them and their Irish neighbours now became frequent. Thus, Olaf, the King of Dublin, was married to a daughter of Aed Finlia, and his successor, Olaf Coram, to the daughter of Morchartach of the Leather Cloaks. From war, they turned to barter as the main source of livelihood. And I hope you all know what that is, but just in case you don't, it's basically an exchange of goods instead of coinage or currency. You basically swap things. Here, I have this purse. I have this mobile phone. Well, let's swap them. <clears throat> Larn, Carlingford, Dundalk, Drogheda, Dawkey, Hoth, Lambay, Wicklow, Arklow, Wexford, Helwick, Cork and Smerwick were all stations where they exchanged wares with the native Irish population. So there you go. In the 10th century, Vikings and Irish exchanged goods right here in Drogheda. You learn something new every day. Dublin became one of the great marts of Europe. Its rulers recognised no external authority any more than did the rulers of Waterford or Limerick. And if these city-states went to war in Ireland, it was often now against one another and in alliance with some Irish king. They thus regarded Ireland in a very full sense as their country and their home. <laughs> okay, good. Timing is good. 
All things considered, the coming of the Norse was a calamity which Irishmen must grievously deplore. They strengthened, it is true, town life, and they developed trade. But these are advantages which weigh little in the scale against the havoc wrought by them in other directions. The old missionary movement to the continent, which brought untold honour to our people, was now transformed into a flight of refugees. The Norse everywhere had an evil reputation for cruelty, cunning and deceit, vices that spread inevitably by contact to the Irish chiefs. Viking drunkenness and immorality were notorious from Ireland to the west of Russia. Traffic in slaves was one of their most fruitful sources of income. Sorry, it says revenue. <laughs> Sorry, probably the same thing, but let's be let's let's stick to the text, Anthony. Stop making it up. What treasures of art and literature they destroyed during two centuries of ravages can never be fully estimated. Their civilization at best was of an inferior quality, as we see from Iceland, where it was left to develop along its own lines and where it ended in social and political anarchy. Small wonder, perhaps, that their assimilation to the Irish people stopped at a certain point beyond which it did not advance for centuries. Well, John Ryan SJ is certainly not... Uh, holding back in his uh, views there, is he? <clears throat> and this section is headed Rise of the Doyle Kosh in Munster. Brian aspires to the high kingship, his success. <clears throat> Excuse me. As a border territory, the tiny kingdom of Doyle Kosh, occupying the eastern half of Clare, had strengthened itself by friendship and alliance with adjoining Connacht states, the Ainya, the Imainya, uh, or the, uh, the Haimani, as they're called, uh, anglicised, and the Jalvana. It first came into prominence under Lorcan and Kinaja, grandfather and father, respectively, of King Brian Boruva, or Brian Boru, as we might call him. Kinaja had endeavoured in 944 to wrest the kingdom of Munster from the Oanacht ruler Kelachan or Kelachan without success. When, however, Kelachan died in 954, the effective rule of the Cashel dynasty ended and an opportunity was offered, which uh, Machavan, Mach who had succeeded Kanaja as the king of Doyle Kosh in, 1950, in 951, 19. I'm adding a whole millennium there. No, it's definitely 951, definitely the 10th century. Soon turned to good account. <clears throat> I need to take another sup of water. The old throat's a bit dry. Assisted by his brother Brian, called Boruva from the high ring fort Bali Boru near Kian Corey, where he was born in 941. And of course, our good friend Alan Hoskins was very familiar with that uh, Bale Boru, uh, which is very close to uh, Balana Killaloo uh, there on the Shannon. He took up the struggle with the Danes of Limerick and harassed them with guerrilla warfare from the woods and fastnesses of Clare. Encounters were many and desperate. Quarter was not asked nor granted on either side. Machavon at last grew disgusted with the conflict and made a truce with the foreigners. But this Brian, this Brian refused to recognize and went on harrowing the Danish settlements till his followers were reduced to 15. Karim Gogas has joined us. He's in the house. Hello, my dear friend, Karim. How are you? Hope you are keeping well. At an assembly of the Dal Kash, he impugned the inactive policy of his brother and had it reversed by popular vote. See, things were democratic back then. So that Machavon was compelled to take the field once more. 
The two brothers inflicted a crushing defeat on the Limerick Danes at Solhoj on the Limerick Tipperary border. Next day, they marched <coughs> without opposition to the town, where they burned the fortifications and retired with immense booty. Probably after this battle, 967, Machavon was acknowledged as King of Cashel or Munster. Quote, more jealous of the Doyle Chosh than fearful of the Danes, unquote. The Oonacht dynasts looked with anger on the rise of a rival house to power. A conspiracy against Machavon's life seems to have been formed. At any rate, the Oonacht chief of the Eifigenshe, uh, that is from Brewery to the Shannon in Limerick, one Donovan captured the king in 967 and sent him prisoner to Maelvoa, Oonacht Prince of Desmond, by whom he was put to death immediately. Two years later, in 978, Brian met Maelvoa in battle at Bialach Lachta near Ardpatrick and defeated and slew him there with 1,200 of his followers. Nasty stuff. But politic in victory, Brian gave his daughter Saive in marriage to Cian, son of Maelvoa, who from that day to Clontarf remained his loyal liege man and his devoted friend. Brian's claim to the kingship of Munster was now undisputed. So trying to figure this out again you have to read things several times to get them don't you the king of ireland from 980 onwards was mile shachlan ii or ado as we might say in ireland mile shachlan the second son of donacha one of the ablest of the southern Inail. his victories against the dublin norse at least equaled in distinction those of brian against the Limerick Danes. Mindful of what had befallen the Oonacht in Munster, Mile Shachlan began to fear for his own security as High King, should Brian's star continue to increase. His suspicions were certainly well grounded, for Brian's aim was nothing less than supreme authority in the land. In 982, Mile Shachlan saw clearly the trend of events and sought to forestall his rival by sending an army to lay waste his territory. Insult was added to injury, for the troops disgraced themselves by destroying at my ire the ancient tree under which the kings of Doyle Kosh were inaugurated. Not a good idea. The stage was now set for an epoch-making contest in which, however, strategy rather than the use of arms was to decide the issue. For some time yet to come, the hands of both kings were tied by serious local disturbances. Mile Shachlan was busy in Breya, a district honeycombed with petty rivalries and private understandings with the Norse. Brian's forces were divided between land hostings against Leinster, Dublin and Meath and river hostings with large fleets upon the Shannon. In 984, Brian invaded Meath and occupied Ishnock, thus ostentatiously flouting the authority of the High King. Mile Shachlan replied next year by laying the Connacht plain known as My E in ashes. And when the Connacht men made a secret raid on his own fortress of uh, Dun Naskia on Loch Enel, he returned to their province and punished them without mercy. His next movement was against the fort of Dublin, which he carried by assault in 989. 
He placed the Norse under tribute and carried off the famous insignia of their kings, Tomar's ring and the sword of Carlos. Pardon me. But having no standing army, he was unable to garrison or hold the city. What's that, Caitlin? I also got a fake Mythical Ireland friend request. They do say that imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. Beware of fake Mythical Ireland accounts. I'm just going to read back here now and see if I missed something. Yeah, I'm not really following that. But anyway, beware of cheap imitations. Where was I? Yes, he was unable to garrison or hold the city. So far, neither king had made appreciable headway against the other. Recognising the deadlock, the two came together on the shore of Loch Ree in 997 and agreed to divide Ireland between them. Brian to rule La Moa, or Moga, and Mael Shacklin to rule La Quinn. Next year, quote, to the joy of all the Irish, unquote, the two united their armies and engaged in joint operations against the Norse. By the agreement with Miles Shacklin, the Kingdom of Leinster fell under Brian's overlordship. In 999, its king, Milvorda, rose in revolt and was supported by the Norse of Dublin. Brian met the rebel host at Glan Mava, a narrow defile near Sagart, and defeated them with terrific slaughter. Milvorda himself took flight and hid in a yew tree, but was discovered and dragged into the open by Murcha, son of Brian. After some weeks as a prisoner, he was liberated and restored to his throne. I bet you thought they were going to kill him, didn't you? The King of Dublin, Citric Silkskegor, which is Citric Silkenbeard, fled to the north and Brian entered the city in triumph. But he agreed to Citric's return and to his holding possession of the fortress on payment of tribute. Indeed, Brian advanced much further along the path of conciliation, for he gave Citric his daughter in marriage and espoused himself Citric's mother, Gorumthwai, a sister of Milvorda. Fascinating, the uh, things that happened in, in medieval times. By 1001, it was evident that the agreement between the rival kings had lost its binding force. Mile Shachlan constructed a ford over the Shannon at Athlone, Athlone, obviously for use against Brian to whose doors he could now lead an army at the shortest notice. A year later, the monster king swooped suddenly upon the ford with a powerful force and, securely ensconced in that strong position, dictated terms to Mile Shachlan. Deserted by the email of the north, who was influenced, <coughs> excuse me, solely, who was influenced solely at this crisis by the petty interests of their own territory, Mile Shachlan had of necessity to submit. Thus, in AD 1002, Brian Baru was undisputed King of Ireland. And this section is start called Brian's Reign. Third and final phase of the struggle with the foreigners, a contest for the sovereignty of Ireland, Clontarf. Revolutionary in the Ireland of that epoch was the new High King's idea of forming a strong central monarchy that would exercise more effective control over the whole country. None but the states of Ulster now resisted his rule, and these he was determined to reduce. Twice he marched against them, and twice retired without battle, as he had often done on similar occasions when he felt that his forces were too weak to make victory absolutely certain. Such caution 
it is hardly necessary to add, was the rarest of qualities in an Irish king. I was just going to say, they usually just would have went headlong into the slaughter, regardless of what the outcome was going to be. Kathy May is heading back to the classroom. Uh, we'll see you next week. Kathy May, thank you for joining us. Once again, in 1004, he renewed the movement against the North, this time with complete success. A hosting by Brian records the annals of Ulster under this year, accompanied by the Princes of Ireland to Ardmacha, where he left 20, 20 ounces of gold on Patrick's chair. He came back bringing with him the hostages of Ireland. Armagh, the see of St. Patrick and of his successors, was then regarded as, in a fashion, the national capital. During his stay in the primatial city, Brian was shown its famous book, the Book of Armagh, still preserved in the library of Trinity College Dublin. And his official historian made in it an entry which concluded with the words, quote, I, Mael Suhan, wrote this in presence of Brian, Emperor of the Irish, unquote. I'm Brian of Ireland. <laughs> uh, never mind. To the description of Brian as Emperor, special significance may be attached. From the early centuries of the faith, the notion of the unity of Christendom, a series of independent states over which the emperor or king of the world held a primacy of honour, was dominant in Ireland. But now the East had become separated from the West. The world empire of the old historians was shattered and the new Christian empire under Charles the Great and the Ottos inspired no loyalty. Brian felt fully justified in regarding himself as supreme temporal ruler within, pardon me, his own dominions. Henry, you're very welcome. And uh, yes, <laughs> my wife is too, or husband. Hi, <laughs> Brian of Dublin. <laughs> so is my wife. <laughs> Though, <clears throat> pardon me. Okay, so it seems several people are getting friend requests for Mythical Ireland. But Mythical Ireland is a page, so it can't actually ask you for a friend request. So I'm presuming that's a fake account. Um, what I'd be inclined to do there, folks, is to report uh, that uh, request uh, to Facebook as a fake. Um, am I right? Yeah, Mythical Ireland, the Mythical Ireland page cannot ask somebody to be a friend. Uh, they can like the page. Uh, but so that's a fake personal account set up under the name of Mythical Ireland. So, uh, yeah, uh, I would say report it to Facebook. And um, yeah, as I say, imitation, flattery and all that. Though 63 years old, when his claim to be emperor of the Irish was recorded, Brian was still a vigorous ruler and made constant circuits of the country to administer justice and receive dues as high king. Well said, Caitlin. Well said. Yes. Indeed. Thrice, says a Norse account, he forgave all his outlaws the same fault, but if they misbehaved oftener, he let them be judged by the law. And from this, one may judge what a king he must have been. For the traditional rights of the subordinate kings, he showed much respect. He strengthened his own residence at Kian Kori, on the high ground near the bridge at Killaloo, and many other places of the south, with solid stone fortresses, a novel form of military defence in Ireland. During his reign, he, quote, continued prosperous and venerated, giving banquets, hospital, hospitable even, <laughs> hospitable, yes, sorry, we'll delete that bit, just judging, ruling with devotion and law, with prowess and valour, unquote.
Joan, you are very welcome. And uh, it's a treat for us to have you in our presence. You're very, very welcome. Michael Trott is uh, uh, in uh, New Zealand and is saying good morning to us. Michael, you're very welcome to the live stream. Churches were rebuilt. Monasteries and schools reopened. Books bought from overseas. Quote, because the books and writings in every church and in every sanctuary had been burned and thrown into the water by the plunderers. Unquote. The peace of this rule was symbolized by the sore story of the solitary woman who could pass in safety from end to end of the island carrying a gold ring upon a horse rod. It must be confessed that the annals afford but limited support to this popular belief. Yet it cannot be denied that Brian did much to heal divisions to revive learning and the arts, and to weld all the peoples of Ireland into a great and prosperous Commonwealth. Cheers to Brian. Leinster, however, remained unreconciled. Yet more so the Norse, still smarting under their many and grievous defeats. Brian's political marriage with Gorumfle, mother of Citric and sister of Mylvorda of Leinster, had turned out unhappy, and the vindictive queen, the most fierce and restless woman of her day, sat brooding on her wrongs and planning dreadful measures of revenge. <laughs> when her brother of Leinster visited Brian at Kinkara, she taunted him bitterly with his cowardice in yielding service to a superior king. What Mylvorda answered on that occasion, we can only guess. But next morning, as he stood watching a game of chess between Morcha, son of Brian, and Conning, a prince of the royal house, he prompted Conning to a move which lost Morcha the advantage. The latter, in anger, made a rude remark about Mylvorda's promptings to the Norse leaders at Glan Mava, Mava, to which that prince replied in high passion that his advice next time would have better results. He departed without the courtesy of leave-taking and felled the messenger sent with an urgent appeal for his return. Brian forbade pursuit but he felt the outrage keenly and promised that satisfaction would be demanded in an imperative manner at Mylvorda's own doorstep. Leinster identified itself with its king and the standard of revolt was forthwith raised. The Norse of Dublin were, were but too anxious to help in levelling a decisive blow to the authority, at the authority of the High King. Now was the time, they thought, to bring the greatest of Irish dynasties to ruins and to transform the ancient state of Ireland into a Norse dominion under a Norse king. Events oversee lent fuel to their ambition. Swain S-W-E-Y-N, not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, King of Denmark, at the head of a mighty fleet, had landed in the Humber in July 1013 to complete the subjugation of England and had succeeded in his task after a campaign of a few months. When he died in January 1014, the inheritance fell to his young son, Knut. <laughs> <laughs> I have to make sure I get the spelling right. C N U T. <laughs> Imagine proofreading that one. I said, let's make sure we get this right. <laughs> the little knut. <laughs> ah, apologies. <laughs> <laughs> Please forgive me while I compose myself. <laughs> ah, yes. So, <clears throat> yes, his inheritance fell 
to his young son, Knut. C N U T. <laughs> Sorry, Mavanway. I apologize. I will compose myself forthwith. <clears throat> <laughs> <laughs> Apologies. <laughs> uh, how puerile. I'm bloody. There's tears in my eyes from the laughing. <laughs> oh, I won't do that again. <laughs> Sorry. I apologize. Yes, pulling myself together right now. <laughs> One moment. <laughs> I mean, I thought I'd heard it all with Citric the Squinty. <laughs> uh, right. Topping myself on, pulling myself together. <laughs> Why should not a similar conquest be achieved by Norse arms in Ireland? Feverish efforts were made to collect ships and fighting men from the Viking territories of the north. Heralds from Citric Silkenbeard, not Citric the Squinty, King of Dublin, arrived at Yule in the Orkneys to request aid from Sigurd the Stout, Jarl or Earl of the Islands. Peter in Monaster Boyce is in the house. Yes, indeed. Cold night after a lovely afternoon. Or Wader Wader Waderick. <laughs> Free Waderick. It's Canute rather than Knut. Okay, right. Anya, thank you for that. Uh, a lot of Norwegians in Ireland call that. I'll never think of the name the same way again. And neither will I, I can assure you. <laughs> Gilly, Earl of the Hebrides, arrived to support the appeal of the heralds. Sigurd did not relish the prospect of conflict with the Irish. But when promised Gormflay to wife and the Kingdom of Ireland as his reward, he agreed to lay aside his scruples. And here we, again, we get an impression of how, yes, uh, how uh, little value the women seem to possess. You know, it's like they're just pieces on a chessboard that get moved around. Uh, Brodier, is it Brodier, Brod, Brodier, Bro, Broder, I don't know how to pronounce it, B-R-O-D-I-R, leader of a battle fleet with base in the Isle of Man, consented to come on the same terms. <laughs> Caitlin Moon, I am not sharing that comment. Birthday or no birthday, because <laughs> you'll just crack me up. I must, I must focus. Serious face. Uh, where was I? I can't even remember. Consented to come on the same terms. He was a man of powerful build, with black hair so long that he tucked it under his belt. In early years, he had been a student for the priesthood, but had lost his vocation and abandoned his faith. Another Norse leader, Ospak, not only refused to take part in the expedition, but gave instead warning to Brian of the preparations that were being made against him. Mercenaries, too, were hired from the Baltic Islands and from the English and Scottish coast. Well-armed and well-disciplined, they would prove under Sigurd a formidable host when they appeared in Dublin at the appointed time shortly before Easter 1014. Yes, and we all are familiar with the Easter Rising of 1916, but here is the Easter rising of 1014. <coughs> the contest was now at hand, a contest in which both sides clearly realised that the prize was nothing less than the sovereignty of Ireland. On St. Patrick's Day, 1014, Brian left Kincorra at the head of his troops and started on the march to Dublin. With him were the men of South Connacht under Ohain of Aigne, Ochiali of 
Emain and the chiefs of Jalvana. To join them came the Ornacht hosts of Munster, albeit old enemies of the Doyle Kosh, the Daishi, many smaller chiefs, and finally the Norse of Waterford. From the borderland of the north came the kings of Brefne and Connachna, that's Leitrim and Longford. From Scotland, the Morvire, or High Steward of Mar, proud of his descent from Irish ancestors. Thank you for sharing that information, uh, Salav, about the fake Mythical Ireland account, which is apparently based in Indonesia. Wow. Hello to Mythical Ireland in Indonesia. Oh, and it's mythical with two eyes. Mythical hyphen lowercase i Ireland using my pictures. And wow. So it seems to be a yes. I'm just scrolling through it. It's a it's an exact clone of the Mythical Ireland page. Very interesting. Yes, as I say, imitation, sincerest form of flattery, but I uh, don't think so. First thing I will do when I'm finished this evening is report that to Facebook. Well, that that might result in any action being taken. Uh, sorry, apologies. I'm getting distracted. Anyway, thank you, Salab, for that information. So if you get a friend request from Mythical Ireland, you'll know it's not me because Mythical Ireland is not a personal account and it can't ask you to be your friend. There you go. Now, where was I? <clears throat> I was somewhere here, the north of Waterford. From the borderland of the north, yes, 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 with Miles Shacklin came numerous battalions from Central Ireland. The Inale of the north stood aloof whilst the forces of Leinster, save Omorda of Leish and Onulon of Fóirte in Carlo, supported the foreigners against their own countrymen. Can you believe it? By Palm Sunday, the hostile fleets had arrived in the bay, and the Irish army under 70 banners lay encamped north of the Liffey in readiness for the dread encounter. Sorcerers were busy within the city, and the sky was full of portents. To Brian's sore disgust, the Norse forced the battle on the morning of Good Friday, April 23rd, 1014. The lines stretched, lines, L-I-N-E-S, not the animals because there weren't any. The lines stretched from Dovegall's bridge near the modern Four Courts in Dublin up to the high ridge where Parnell Square and Mount Joy Square now stand, then down to the Tolka at Clontarf. All this, of course, was open country, for the city lay then entirely to the south of the Liffey. Donal Morvair of Mar on the one side and a champion from Norway on the other are said to have opened the battle. Morcha led the Irish forces, Sigurd and Brodir the Norse, for Citric, King of Dublin, did not himself take part in the conflict. In a tent just behind the Irish lines, Brian awaited the result, praying earnestly the while for victory. From dawn till evening the battle raged, until at last the Norse ranks were utterly broken. Hey! For the Irish. Sorry, did I celebrate that a little bit too vociferously? I apologise. Alas, then, for the foreign fighting men, with the rising tide between them and their ships, and the Irish army between them and the bridge. Panic speedily prevailed, and the day ended in a wild pursuit. So unrestrained was the excitement at this hour that the High King was left unguarded. Brodeer, in headlong flight, stumbled by accident on his tent and cleft his head in twain before rushing onward to his own death. Ireland was saved. But Brian, the great king, was no more. Victory, it must needs be said, 
was purchased at a high price. Almost all the chiefs on the Irish side lay dead. Morcha amongst them, with Torjelvach his son and Conang his nephew. Sigurd too lay among the slain, and Brodir, who slew Brian, with many scions of Citric's house and innumerable minor leaders. Hey, Mariana Dull just got a package from Tom King, delivered by Postman. Woo! Excellent stuff. Don't forget, you can have your own by visiting the Mythical Ireland website on Gova Creations. Then, according to the Honor Ulster Annals, came the successor of St. Patrick with his clergy to Sword Column Kill Swords, quote, and carried the body of Brian, King of Ireland, and the body of his son, Morcha, and the head of Cumming, and the head of Mothla, a Daishi chief, and interred them in Ard Macha in a new tomb. Twelve nights were the congregation of Patrick waking the bodies in honour of the dead king. No such tribute had ever been paid before or would ever be paid again to a dead monarch of Ireland. To the Norse strongholds along the southern seas, sorry, I'll read that again because I read it wrong. To the Norse strongholds along the northern seas, the doleful news of Clontarf was carried. The sagas tell how keenly the calamity was appreciated. It marked indeed the end of an era for the attempt to establish Norse supremacy in Ireland would never be renewed. In Dublin, the colony remained much as it was before the battle, always a distinct but henceforth a very petty state, paying tribute as a rule to Irish kings. From every other point of view, the effect of the battle was adverse. Brian's purposes as king were certainly worthy of the highest praise. As a statesman, he has few compeers in our history, but his work was barely begun and a cruel fate decreed that it should never be completed. A more effective central authority than that which the Inail had exercised would doubtless have been of advantage to the country. Brian died before such an authority could be constituted. Princes of his own and of rival dynasties might have learned much from his career but all that in fact they learned was the bad principle that the high kingship was a prize for which strong hands might contend. What an evil influence this had on the internal peace and ultimately on the security of the nation, the following chapters will demonstrate. And that draws to a close the current part of our exploration of the Vikings. I will find some more material to continue with next week. I'm thinking I might read a section of Hogu Gael Regalif, which is the battle of the the Gaels versus the Gauls or the Irish versus the foreigners, uh, which uh, was apparently written as a panegyric to Brian Baru, but I think we might find it interesting. Excuse me. Um, uh, apologies for the uh, breakdown in service there while I completely split my sides laughing. And next week, I promise I will wear my corset. Those of you who are familiar with Blackadder may get the reference there. Those of you not familiar may not get the reference at all and will be completely lost. Hope you've all enjoyed this evening's um, live stream. Uh, we'll be back, obviously. Later this week, we have St. Patrick's Day and St. Sheila's Day. I may do something around that. Um, I uh, have some interesting thoughts about Patrick uh, and the relationship of the stories of Patrick to uh, pre-Christian uh, mythology, which I might uh, do a live stream on on St. Patrick's Day. Don't forget that Friday is St. Sheila's Day for the first time uh 
uh, Ireland has instituted a public holiday for that day. It used to be pre-famine times that St. Sheila's Day was an additional day of respite from the fast. In other words, a day when you could drink during the, the Lenten fast, uh, which St. Patrick's Day always was. But apparently the celebrations in many parts used to continue into Sheila's Day. Sadly, Sheila's Day as a celebration seems to have uh, diminished or disappeared completely um, uh, uh, after uh, the Great Famine. Uh, please do consider becoming a patron or supporting the work. Uh, don't forget you can uh, buy signed copies of my written work on mythicalireland.com or indeed of Tom King's wonderful On Gova Creations. Uh, and watch this space for further developments on that front. Thank you very much. Uh, the Rins Ranger saying, you described the king hiding in a yew tree. There's a British slash English story of King Charles I or the second. There's people trying to kill him and he climbs up a big oak tree. Parallel stories, nearly interesting stuff. Absolutely. Sounds fascinating. And uh, thank you indeed, uh, all of you, for your kind comments. Glad you enjoyed it. Um, uh, happy birthday, by the way, to Daisy Peters, whose birthday is, what is it, the 16th? Is it two days' time? Is that right? Um, so um, I'm just scrolling back through the comments to find it. But every time a new comment comes up, it jumps back again. Stop that. That's annoying. Happy birthday to you, Daisy, anyway, from all of us. Hope you have a great day. and. Uh, you are uh, one of the most regular regulars, almost always here. Uh, so it is a, a great pleasure for us to finish this evening by singing in... Hang on. Wait, 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 wait. No, wait. I've got something really special. Wait. Don't disappear, anyone, just yet. I promise you, you'll enjoy this. Let me just find this. Do -do 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 -do. So you know I'm in the brass band, don't you? The Drogheda Brass Band. Well, we have a very, very special rendition of Happy Birthday, and this is for Caitlin and for Daisy. Wait till you hear this. Enjoy. This is Drogheda Brass Band's rendition of Happy Birthday. <laughs> Wonderful. Happy birthday to you all. A very good evening from Mythical Ireland. See you next time. Enjoy yourselves. Stay safe. Be well. And join us next time. I'm Anthony Murphy. This has been Live Irish Myths. Ikawa Kolosov. Slong Gafol. August Togo Bogay.